Hello and welcome to lesson two, which is relative age dating. All right, so just a review, um, granite is a igneous rock. So all of these pictures are intrusive. And we know that because they are all uh, minerals being shown. So you can see different colors and different colors are minerals. And so we know that they were all um, formed under the ground. All right, so um, what we're looking at this time is um, what relative dating is, is um, in relation to something else. So I would be older than you. Um, so that's relative. Um, I am younger than my parents. That's also relative. Um, so, um, so relative dating is comparing it to things around it. Um, so when we look at that, we need to know this principle called uniformitarianism. And basically that just states that if something has not been disturbed, um, that layers will be oldest on the bottom, youngest on top. And also what it states, um, specifically this uniformitarianism, is that the processes that are occurring today also occurred billions of years ago. So um, the rock cycle that's occurring today is the same rock cycle that occurred billions of years ago. Um, volcanic processes that are occurring today occurred billions of years ago in the same way. Um, and so that's what uniformitarianism is. And that is first stated by James Hutton, who is on the right there in the 1700s. So he observed, um, you know, river erosion processes going on. And if they are going on today in the same manner that they were going on millions of years ago. All right. So relative age dating. So if we look at this picture, um, the bottom here is older than the top. We can see that these layers are um, horizontal, so they're not tilted upwards or anything like that. And so we know that the oldest layers will be on the bottom because they have to be there first for the other layers to be laid on top. And if you were to take sand and sprinkle it across something, the sand layers aren't going to be vertical. Um, they're going to lay down horizontal. Um, they might be wavy, but they'll be horizontal. And so, um, so this is the relative aging. If I was a uh, relative dating, if I were looking at the age of something here, I know that this is younger than everything below it. And I know that this is older than everything above it. All right, so there's four principles um, for relative age dating. And, um, and so we've got, um, and those are in the 1700s, then we have one more added. So the five principles um, that you see here, the, and we'll talk about each one today. Um, so original horizontality, um, superposition, original lateral continuity, um, cross-cutting relationships, and inclusions. So all of those principles um, you should know, uh, and so we'll talk about them today. All right, so horizontality. So what that means is that um, if the layers are horizontal, meaning flat like this, then uh, this will be the oldest, this will be the youngest. And notice how these are not. So these layers have been disturbed. And so they are not following the original horizontality principle because they have been changed. They've been uplifted, pushed over. Uh, but these ones all display that principle. But if we look at these layers, they used to be horizontal. So we know that this Vishnu schist is the old is older compared to this um, rock here towards the right um, because it's on the bottom, even though it's been tipped, it's on the bottom. And we see this in the Grand Canyon. So we see this is exactly what the Grand Canyon looks like. Um, and then towards the bottom, we have these layers that are kind of tipped under the riverbed here. And so that means that there was some type of um, movement. Um, mountain building or something that occurred. And then after that, nothing's occurred. So after that, it's completely flat layers. So it hasn't been disturbed since. All right. So superposition, this states kind of like what I just said. So it states that the old, if, the, if everything is horizontal, then the oldest layer will be on the bottom. Youngest is on top. So the Kaibab limestone here on the top is the youngest, whereas the um, Tapit sandstone out of these horizontal layers is the oldest. All right, and then cross-cutting relationships, um, basically this states that if something cuts across something else, then whatever cu it's cutting through is older. So think about a cake, so a layered cake, for example. You have all these layers, and if you cut through the cake, the cake has to be there first, right? You can't cut through air and then make a cake around it. So, um, so the layers were there first, and then something cut through it. So cross-cutting relationships, if you look at E here, E is the youngest feature here because it cuts through all the layers. So if it only cut through B and C, then it would be younger than B and C, but older than 
than A, but it cuts through everything. So this fault, and um, if you notice, this is the hanging wall. This is the foot wall. Don't know if you guys remember, but um, but anyways, and so this has slipped down. So this hanging wall has slipped down. And so this would be a normal fault. So it's tension pulling it apart, causing this to slip down relative to the foot wall. Um, so, um, so this cross cutting though, going back to this, this thing, this fault is younger than everything else. So this fault occurred, if we were to want to figure out what time this fault occurred, then we could date A. So we could figure out the age of A and know that at least E is younger. So at some point it occurred before, um, after A formed. All right, so if we determine relative age, so notice how if we look at these layers, this would be like kind of like the Grand Canyon. So we've got this um, layer and this has been filled in. So this might be a river that cut through this and then it filled in with rock. Um, so this layer is the same age as this layer. This layer would be the same age as this layer. And so this is really helpful like at the Grand Canyon, for example, for matching layers of rock that are on either side of this canyon. Um, we can look at the different rock types and we can match them. And they've done that with um, South America and Africa. So remember how they used to be together during Pangea. Well, we've done this. We've looked at those mountains that are the same. And same thing with the Appalachians. We've talked about the Appalachians are part of Greenland and a little bit into Eurasia. And so we can look at the age of the rock here and the type and all of the different fossils maybe that we find. And we can see that it matches clear across continents um, clear across the ocean or just across a canyon. Um, but that is the principle of lateral continuity. So lateral meaning that it goes across here and continues. So it continues laterally is all, all that means. All right, so um, principle of inclusion. It states that any rock fragment, including inclusions in a rock layer must be older than the rock layer that contains them. So um, this has to be, if this rock layer so let's say this is a rock, for example, just a piece of rock. And so um, let's say that magma flowed over the area. Well, if it flows over the area and it includes something, then that intrusion had to, it has to be older. Um, and so think of like chocolate chips, for example, you make chocolate chip cookies. If you put the chocolate chips in it, the chocolate chips are older than the cookie itself. The chocolate chips had to be made before the cookie was made. And so this is kind of the same thing. So this rock had to have been made before this rock flowed over it. And remember there's different melting temperatures. So this might have a higher melting temperature. So magma was over, able to flow over it, but didn't quite melt it. Um, and so that would be how that forms. So the principle of inclusion means that if there's something included in it, then that inclusion in the case, this rock has to be older. Earth science. Geologic time and relative dating. To understand geologic history, an important question to ask is, what came first? Reading the rock record is like doing puzzles. You look for clues to solve the order of timing. What happened first? Geologists study rock outcrop, the natural exposure of rock layers, or even man-made exposures, such as we see in a road cut. In sedimentary rock outcrops, an obvious feature is bedding layers the way sediments are deposited one on top of the other. Although some rock layers can be folded or tilted, when the layers were first formed, when the sediment was deposited, it was laid down in horizontal beds, layer upon layer, extending in all directions. The principles of relative dating helped piece together Earth's history, and they helped to answer what came first. There are four straightforward relative dating principles. First, original horizontality that layers of sediment are deposited horizontally. Second is superposition, that in an undeformed horizontal sequence of sedimentary rocks, the top rock layer is younger than the bottom layer. Third, cross-cutting. For example, when an igneous intrusion or a fault cuts through pre-existing rock, the intrusion is younger than the rock through which it cuts. And fourth, inclusions, when pieces of one rock are contained within another. The inclusion is older than the rock containing it. Onward.
All right, so um, if we look at these different principles that were discussed, and we're trying to figure out the relative age, um, we can look at all these different features that have formed, um, but sometimes we get um, things that are missing, so pieces that are missing, so it's not all there. It's like, um, if we look at the rock record, it's like taking pages out of a book, so maybe a chapter is missing here and there. And so we have to kind of put it together with missing pieces, and so those are unconformities. Um, so an unconformity, um is a, like an erosional feature so we'll look at a few different ones here um so these three types here we've got a disconformity um, and we'll talk about each one of these here and then an angular unconformity and a non-conformity so um the first one the disconformity um basically forms when a horizontal layer of sedimentary rock overlies another horizontal layer of sedimentary rock that has been eroded so they're all flat so notice how no uplift has occurred so basically um, there was very little erosion. So if we look at like a desert, there is very little sediment being put down. And so you're not going to get very many layers forming when there's a desert versus, versus when there's an ocean or a lake or something overlying it. So we get lots of erosion occurring and then um, climate changes and we get different features that are laid down on top. So in this case, this is limestone. So this was a desert. This is like the Grand Canyon, for example. So desert and then it was overlaid by a shallow ocean at one time. So that was limestone, but this in between has been eroded. So there's sometimes millions of years that are missing. So that's a disconformity. And then um, you've got a non-conformity. So this picture on the right is the second bullet. And so basically um, we've got um, igneous rock layer has eroded. And then, um, and so this is the igneous rock. So think of this like a mountain range or something like that. And then um, there's uh, climate change or something um, is occurring that creates different types of um, deposition or erosion. And so now there's different layers that are laid down on top and it's um, buried basically this um, mountain range or a feature of the year. It might not be as big as a mountain range, but it's some type of feature. Um, and so that would be a non-conformity. And so once again, we've got some pieces missing here. So if we were to dig down here, we wouldn't see the same rock as if we dug down over here. Um, and then the last one, the angular unconformity, basically there's been uplift. So this has happened in the Grand Canyon also. We've got all three of these, well, actually not all three, but all these two on the left have occurred in the Grand Canyon. And so we had uplift occurring. And so Grand Canyon layers have been pushed up and then they stopped um, because uplift has stopped and then flat layers laid down on top. And so we've got pieces missing. So once again, if we were to dig down here, we would see a different rock type than if we dug down over here. Um, and so that's how that would occur. Um, so you can see these pictures again. And so basically I just it described this one here. So we've got some kind of tilt, mountain building or something occurred. And then we've got flat layers laid down on top. All right, so if we look at different layers, we can correlate them. So correlate just means put them together. So notice how there's different rock outcroppings. And so in the Grand Canyon, um, it's not all uniform. So some areas will be missing certain pieces, some areas won't. So if we look at these rocks, so notice how this Kaibab formation, um, we've got them, um, this is in the Mesozoic, so in that time period. And so the Kaibab formation is here and here. And then notice how this piece does not have the Navajo sandstone. So Navajo sandstone occurred here and here, and this would be, um, you know, getting closer to the Cenozoic. And so, um, so we've got, we can compare different parks. So we've got the Grand Canyon, we've got Zion, and we've got Bryce. And so we've got a different variety of colors, which is kind of cool. But we also have different pieces that are missing in, like, say, the Grand Canyon. So notice how we don't have anything above the Kaibab formation. But in, in um, Zion and Bryce, we do. And so we can look at um, those fossils maybe that are found there and, um, and figure out um, other pieces of the book. So it's like having the chapter be missing in the Grand Canyon but we find it over here in Zion. And then chapters that are missing in Zion, we find over here in Bryce. Um, and that's very common because the rock record is very incomplete because of erosion. All right, so a key bed is something that we can serve as a time marker. So um, a key bed, for example, is like trilobites. So trilobites are really, really abundant, um, but they only lived a short period of time. So we can use those as a key bed, or maybe there was a volcanic eruption. So if there's a volcanic eruption that occurs, um, then that will blanket ash across the entire world. Um, like for example, Yellowstone. 
And so we can see that in the rock record and we know exactly, it's kind of like a time marker. So kind of like an index. Um, and we can see where that occurred and where we're at because we can't always date all the rocks. Um, we have to have radiometric dating to do that and or, or a fossil. And so if there isn't something that we can date radiometrically, which is an element or um, a fossil, then we can't really date that rock. We have to use relative dating. So we use um, a couple different types of dating. We use relative and we also use um, a kind where we know the exact age. So looking at radiometric dating. All right, so notice here, we've got some pieces missing. So one, two is missing over here on this side. And then three, these are um, brachiopods, a type of fossil. And um, these are ammonite, ammonites, um, so they're also a type of fossil. And then we're missing number five. So over here, here's an unconformity. So we're missing that piece, but over here we have that piece. So this might be the difference of the Grand Canyon versus Bryce Canyon or Zion. Um, and then over here, we've got six and six. So those match up, um, the fossils anyways. And then over here, we have seven and eight, but we don't have seven and eight over here. And so we can use these fossils to help us piece together the missing pieces. Um, and these fossils are called index fossils. So these are some examples. And so an index fossil is basically something that lived really abundantly. So these are usually ocean creatures, but there's tons of them and they live for a short period of time. So for example, if we're looking at the trilobite. So the trilobite lived during the Cambrian period. It only lived during the Cambrian period. So if we find a trilobite, then we know that it's from the Cambrian period. Um, if you go over to Shasta College, um, there are a ton of trilobite fossils over there. And it's really cool. So that's from the Cambrian period, which is a really long time ago. Um, so pretty neat. Uh, and then you can also see these other things that lived, different, lived during different time periods. So we can use them to help date the rocks because if we find them in that rock, then um, it has to be that that piece lived during that time period. And so it helps us to date the rocks. All right, so here's some trilobites examples. So trilobites did evolve, so they didn't always stay the typical trilobite. Um, and I do have some trilobite fossils that you guys can look at um, next week or actually at the end of this week. Um, but anyways, here's some different time, different ones. So during the Cambrian period, the Ordovician, the Silurian, and so on. Um, so they looked different. They did um, form differently, look differently as evolution occurred. Uh, but we can help use those to date rocks. Um, and they lived during a very short time period in Earth's history. I mean, it might be 100 million years, but that's a short time period in Earth's history when we're talking about 4.6 billion Imagine that you were reading a great book, but that someone had removed a random series of pages. But like those missing pages, you might not be able to figure out relationships between characters and other plot details. Geologists try to decipher the record of Earth's history as told in the rocks, but often there are parts of the story that are missing, rock layers that have been removed by erosion or never formed in the first place. In this lesson, we will use Plato and lots of photos from the Western US to illustrate how geologists recognize those gaps in time. Our learning objectives are that you'll be able to identify the characteristics of different types of features called unconformities and to explain how they formed. These unconformities are the physical representation of a gap in time. So what exactly is an unconformity? An unconformity is an erosion surface representing a gap in time between the formation of two sections of rock. If rocks have been eroded away or were not formed in the first place, we have no way of interpreting what was going on at that time in Earth's past. Most unconformities are old erosion surfaces. We recognize them because the rocks above and below the surface have different orientations or different properties. There are three types of unconformities we would like you to learn about. Let's take a closer look at how these things form. We will start with angular unconformities. First imagine a series of horizontal layers of sedimentary rock forming under marine conditions. Next we are going to uplift these rocks to the surface, similar to what might happen at a convergent plate boundary. During uplift, the rock layers may be tilted, faulted, are folded so that are no longer in their horizontal configuration. Now that these rocks are exposed at the surface, the uppermost layers would be removed by erosion. If these rocks are now resubmerged, new horizontal layers will be deposited on top of the erosion surface. The rocks above and below the unconformity have different orientations, and this surface between the folded lower layers and the horizontal upper layers represents an angular unconformity. In this example from Utah, the angular unconformity places a tan-colored layer of sedimentary rock on top of tilted red-colored rocks. 
Let's consider another situation where layers of sedimentary rock form under marine conditions. However, instead of tilting the layers, we are simply going to uplift them, erode some of the uppermost layers, and then resubmerge them. Here's our original sequence of rocks. Now, here comes the erosion, removing some of those layers. Now we get renewed deposition, forming new horizontal layers that will be parallel to those that formed earlier. So it can be difficult to tell where the unconformity surface is present. This type of unconformity is known as a disconformity. Geologists might look for evidence of old soil horizons between layers, or they might recognize that the fossils in the rocks above and below the erosion surface lived many millions of years apart. In this example from Hungary, the different colored layers lie parallel to each other on either side of a disconformity. The final type of unconformity is a nonconformity. A nonconformity places a sedimentary rock on top of igneous or metamorphic rock. These rocks may have been uplifted to the surface and exposed by erosion and mountain ranges that were subsequently slowly eroded before the region was resubmerged below a rising ocean. Sedimentary rocks would be deposited above these igneous or metamorphic rocks that originally formed deep within Earth's crust. In this example, a nonconformity places a sandstone formation on top of much older igneous rocks. So let's practice your powers of interpretation. How would you classify the unconformities pictured here? In the left image, you can see that the sedimentary layers have different orientations above and below the unconformity surface. The surface itself is tilted, making the interpretation a little more challenging but it parallels the layers above the unconformity. The layers to the right are more steeply inclined. Consequently, we would interpret this as an angular unconformity. The other photograph shows a pair of disconformities in the Grand Canyon. The red wall limestone rests unconformably on top of both the Temple Butte Formation and the Muav Limestone. Much of the Temple Butte Formation has been removed by erosion. The disconformity between the red wall and Muav Formations represents a gap of over 160 million years. Now, let's examine another image from the Grand Canyon. It turns out there are two well-defined unconformities in this view. The first is a nonconformity near the base of the section, and the second is a disconformity within the sedimentary rocks of the distant cliffs. Let's go find them. We can actually see all three types of unconformities we discuss displayed in this figure. In the base of the canyon, we have igneous and metamorphic rocks that are overlain by the Tapit sandstone. This would be an example of a nonconformity. This is what that looks like if you were to hike down to the bottom of the canyon. The surface is known as the Great Unconformity because it separates fossil-bearing sedimentary rocks and much older rock units formed before fossils became abundant. Nearby, we have the rocks of the Grand Canyon Supergroup that are overlain by the same sandstone layer. This is an example of an angular unconformity. We can see the tilted layers of the older rocks below the light-colored, near-horizontal tapete sandstone near the top of the image. Finally, there are several places in this section where there are disconformities representing significant chunks of geologic time. Two of the most significant are represented by the red arrows. For example, as we mentioned earlier, the surface between the red wall and Muav limestones is approximately 160 million years. However, when we look at these rocks in the walls of the canyon, it's nearly impossible to identify any significant differences that would tell us such a huge time gap was present between the units. It's only through careful examination of the fossils in the limestones that we can recognize the contrast. So we have three different types of unconformities here, all one on top of each other, each representing a big chunk of time. So when we go to the Grand Canyon and we look at all those rocks, there is an impression that it must represent a vast array of geologic time. And it does, but it also represents huge gaps in geologic All right, and that is it. So hopefully you guys enjoyed and I'll see you next time.